Hello, everyone, and hello to the CG Spectrum community, and welcome to our webinar, How to Make Oscar-Worthy VFX with the team from Love and Monsters, presented by CG Spectrum. We're going to look behind the scenes at how teamwork and leadership make for some incredible VFX. So we have got some great guests today. Um, we're very lucky to have two of the team members from uh, Love and Monsters, worked on VFX for Love and Monsters joining us today. They are VFX supervisor, Jen Camilleri and CG supervisor, Stephanie Pocklington. And their incre incredible visual effects on Love and Monsters, as you all know, has been nominated for an Academy Award. So congratulations to both of you. Our host today is Maxine Schnepp. And Hi, she is the career development manager at CG Spectrum. My name is Zoe. I'm the digital content producer at CG Spectrum, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'll start off by introducing us and the school, and then I'll hand it off to Maxine, who will lead our discussion and share some of the amazing uh, before and after VFX photos from Love and Monsters. So our webinar today is presented by CG Spectrum. We are an online animation, VFX, digital art, and game design school offering specialized job-focused training. We're a rookies certified school and we offer a range of courses from beginner courses to advanced diplomas that will set you up for a successful career in film and games. All of our classes are taught by industry mentors in small online groups with a maximum of four students or one-to-one -one private mentorship. Our guests today are Jen Camilleri, who worked as VFX supervisor on Love and Monsters at Mr. X, formerly Mill Film. Jen has previously held positions as VFX supervisor, sequence lead, and compositor, and has formerly worked at studios including ILM, Method Studios, and Animal Logic. Her past work includes films like Top Gun Maverick, Love, Death, and Robots, Kong, Skull Island, Peter Rabbit, Doctor Strange, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and Mad Max Free Road, which by the way, I saw in theaters like four times. I think that's my record for seeing a movie in theaters. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Jen is also a new compositing mentor at CG Spectrum, so you can take new compositing courses directly with her as your teacher, and we'll have more information about her course later in the webinar. We're also joined by Stephanie Pocklington, who is the CG supervisor on Love and Monsters by Mr. X, formerly Mill Film. Stephanie's held a variety of supervisory lead and senior roles at studios like ILM, Weta, Sony, MPC, Mr. X, and Animal Logic. Her credits include Rogue One, X-Men, Avatar 2, Jurassic World, and Transformers, and most recently, Mortal Kombat. Finally, our host today is CG Spectrum's career development manager, Maxine Schnepp. Maxine's job is to ensure students are the best prepared and connected for life in the industry by offering valuable resources like an insider's perspective into the hiring process, and she's helping students to stand out amongst other candidates um, to break into the film and games industries. So Maxine is a former VFX producer at Technicolor and resources manager at Mr. X, and she's been involved in all stages of the VFX production pipeline. And her credits include Blade Runner 2049, War for the Planet of the Apes, Spider-Man Homecoming, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Doctor Strange, Star Trek Beyond, Independence Day Resurgence, and the three Star Wars films. So now I'll hand off to Maxine, who will also take us through uh, some incredible VFX breakdowns and lead our discussion with Jen and Stephanie. So happy to be here. Thank you for that amazing introduction, Zoe. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This is so exciting. We have people from all over the world. I see a lot of CG Spectrum students as well and some not so familiar faces. So thank you for joining us, even if you are not one of our students. Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about first when we get started is teamwork and leadership in the industry, especially in visual effects. Um, projects like this one, they're quite big. So many people are involved. And so it really takes strong leadership like Genevieve and uh, Stephanie to create a movie as awesome as this. Um, hopefully most of the people here watching have seen the movie. There might be a couple of spoilers, at least um, in terms of how the monsters look. Um, so get ready for that. We're gonna be looking at some breakdowns as well. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, but just to get things started, um, I want to know a little bit about your backgrounds, Steph and Jen. Um, so we'll start with Jen. What have you done in the past that helped you sort of prepare for a VFX supervisor role on this project? Yeah, well, uh, my background is in compositing. So that's where I started. Well, actually, before compositing, I started in roto and paint. So even oh, nice. sort of more rudimentary and broken down than in compositing. Um, so I spent about six months just sort of working on roto and paint 
And then the following five years after that was really just practicing my compositing skills and just working at my level from a junior compositor through to a senior compositor and really learning Nuke and the tools and the different type of films and the different type of techniques and work that you may work on for various films. Because every single film you work on is completely different. You use a slightly different set of skills and creativity. Um, so they're all really quite unique, and especially a film like Love and Monsters, where we had um, five to six sort of hero, really unique creatures that were all had their individual creativity and um, technical challenges. So then after working as a compositor for about five years, um, I ventured over to, to Canada to sort of really expand my skills because at the time in Australia, there wasn't very many uh, studio opportunities. So I ventured over to Canada where I then was given the opportunity to step up as a lead compositor. So yes. as a lead compositor, I was then, you know, able to start building up my, my team skills or my team sort of supervisor skills so I was more sort of looking after the, the compositing team and, and helping them um, in terms of like the technical and creative guidance that they might need to learn along the way um, to sort of finish their work um, to the standard of the film. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, so slowly from the leadership role, it kind of progressed naturally to a compositing supervisor. So again, it was like a little bit less hands-on with each of the artists, but a little bit more overseeing the entire compositing work for the films that I was working on. And then nice. after, um, you know, working as a compositing supervisor for a little while, I was then given the opportunity to step up into the more overall um, DFX and VFX supervisor role. So I was looking sort of over the, in, um, the entire film. So every single department I kind of was involved in and creatively and um, technically sort of helping make decisions of how and what we should do uh, on each film. So, I mean, it was a, probably the span of my career has been about 11 years. So it, it takes time to learn these skills and, and to get experience. Cause as I was saying, like every film is, is quite different. So it takes a lot of time to sort of build up your skills and your confidence in your skill to then be able to sort of step up into a supervisor role. Um, and my background mm -hmm. being in compositing, uh, so in compositing, you're exposed to all the departments because you're at the very end of the, the production line. So you're given work from the effects team, the matte painting team, um, the lighting team. They're all sort of feeding their work to the compositor. So you get insights into, into all those different departments. And then your job is to put all them together and, and make the, the final product. So coming from the compositing um, sort of background, it really helps in terms of um, stepping up into a visual effects supervisor role, because you kind of have a broad knowledge of, of all the departments. Mm -hmm. so that's that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, my journey. <laughs> it's a long one. I have, okay, <laughs> I, usually we save most of the Q and A's to the end, but this one's a little bit relevant um, from Hannah, who's watching. Um, and she's asking, what would you say is your weakest skill? This is now my a job interview. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, to, to be honest, um, going into the supervisor roles is probably um, starting out with, I guess, communication and, and working with the team. Um, only because what you learn along the way is that every single person is quite individual and unique and everybody works slightly differently and in their own way. Um, so maybe in terms of getting into the supervisor role, the biggest learning curve was trying to learn I guess all the different personalities and how to relate and work with them um, because you know one person you might be able to just be really blunt with your notes and be like no that just looks way too blue you got to make it more red um, but the next person you sort of they interpret that a little bit differently so you got to sort of communicate to them in a slightly different way and that was probably the, the biggest sort of learning curve getting into a supervisor role I think for myself. Yeah and that's one of those things that um, you know so many of these technical and creative schools don't necessarily teach. Um, I know we just started building that into our course curriculum here at CG Spectrum is like talking about soft skills. Like we're learning all of these technical things and all these amazing creative things, but hey, we're all still human. We all still need to learn how to work together um, on these big projects. So that, that's a really good point. And great question, Hannah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say like VFX is completely team orientated. There's no sort of like individual, no matter what work you do, it's always passed on to a bunch of different other artists to work on as well. So communication is like a really big, important step in, in VFX. 
I was going to say that there's lots of people who are from all over the world too, and it's like a high pressure environment. So it's a wonder that anyone really uh, actually gets along and gets things done, but it happens and it works out really well. So it's pretty cool yeah. to watch. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally agree. Um, Stephanie, same, same question for you. Tell us a little bit about your past and how you got to the place um, you're at now. Yeah, um, so I have like a fine arts background. Um, I've always kind of done freelance artwork on the side um, and I started off as that essentially. Um, and I also kind of dabbled in like archeology span for a little bit. Sorry, motorcycle. <laughs> um, <laughs> dabbled in archeology span for a little bit, um, but then I figured, you know, um, I wanted to learn 3D software for some of my clients because I didn't know it. It was mostly traditional like graphic design and logo work and kind of just concept art. Um, mm -hmm. so to school for that I took a certificate program at uh, Vancouver Film School um, and then just at the same time Vancouver happened to have a lot of film work and it still kind of does so I didn't realize it was an option so I actually just applied to a bunch of places there and I ended up being a runner for about eight months and a runner is kind of just like a job where you get coffee you kind of sort out the mail and like order you know like drinks for the team and stuff and overtime meals mm -hmm. um, so actually it was really beneficial because I got to learn uh, what you know, like the base level of visual, visual effects, like at a studio. Um, and this is at MPC in Vancouver when it was still there. Um, nice. And I also did a little bit of reception too. So I just kind of dabbled in all those intro roles. But from there- I, I did that to too. I did that too as one of my first jobs. <laughs> I was like an office manager picking up phones all day. <laughs> like every, everybody come in and everything. Um, and, and especially with the runner role, you get to learn, you get to meet everybody essentially. So you see all the different kind of roles that you could take on. Anyway, I specialized in modeling at school anyway. So they learned that I could do a little bit of that. Um, and so I did that on the side. So you, I would, you know, I would work during the day and then at night I would, I would stay behind and, um, and do modeling for them on Man of Steel. And then after that, nice. I was uh, so much work that they were giving me notes and they said, okay, let's make you do this full time so that you can actually address these notes. And that's kind of how I started um, doing it full time. And from there I went from, you know, modeling to environment modeling uh, then texturing a little bit, um, and then as well as like, you know, some of the more traditional map painting. Uh, then I went into tech anim, which is um, not even related, but they just needed some help. And then I learned from there. And so I was kind of doing like this ring around the rosy with all these um, departments for a while. Uh, and then, you know, from there, I became a lead uh, environment artist, um, because most of my time was spent modeling and environments. Um, and, and learning about that. And so I did that on um, a couple of projects and then I moved into a CG suit role for this, another monster movie called Monster Calls, um, which also released on Netflix, I think like six or six months ago, maybe, or maybe a year ago. Oh, awesome. I'm gonna um, like write that down to check it out later. <laughs> weird. Um, but uh, yeah, and so then I, I ended up taking a break because I wanted to look, go to other studios and learn how they work. Um, and so I went over to, you know, ILM and Sony and stuff like that and learned a little bit more in Weta. And then I, uh, I was in uh, New Zealand when I got a call, um, I was working on like Avatar 2 or whatever. And they, it was Mill Film that called me and said, hey, we've got this amazing monster movie and we're the only vendor. And I was like, oh, okay, fine, I'll go. So it was, that's how I ended up, you know, in Australia, of course, uh, and then continuing CG souping from there. That's amazing. And like this just proves like both of you had completely different career paths and any students here that that know me know that I talk about this all the time <laughs> in, in classes and stuff, but everyone's path is going to be different like coming from a, you know, fine arts background, you know, you were a runner, you're picking up phones doing like administrative work, Jen was doing roto and paint like there's so many different ways to get into the industry as long as you have that passion and you're like, I'm willing to work hard and do whatever I can to, to get to that point eventually. You know, we all have goals that, that we want down the line, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, back to Jen real quick. Um, do you have any tips? Like what do you, would you say is like the top skill that you look for um, for someone who, who might be a leader in the future? Like what's one thing that that you would say that they would really need to work on? Um, yeah, probably uh, taking initiative, I think is, is sort of a big thing, um, which also comes with having confidence in, in your work. Um, so I think in the, the leadership roles, you kind of, you, you are a little bit in the end, the decision makers, everybody I feel like um, is working on the same level or all working on the same thing. But unfortunately, mm. at the end of the day, there is somebody that has to make the hard decisions of which option or um, which direction we're gonna go in. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, yeah, taking that, showing a little bit of initiative of saying, yeah, I think, I think this is the way we should go and, and we'll go down this path and see how that um, nice. sort of works. Yeah. Do you have, do you have another 
skill, Stephanie, or do you think that's like probably your top skill as well <laughs> that you would recommend? Um, I think like it's uh, what makes a good leader. I think it's important to learn conflict resolution skills, um, mm. not just fighting all the time, but there's going to be differences of opinion. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's always going to happen. So I think skills learning, you know, somebody's side and another person's side and kind of reaching a resolution that benefits all parties um, mm. in the best way possible. I think that is a, it's a skill to have for sure to think about that. Um, and to just get point. to know what people are driven by, I think, like what motivates them and try to, you know, bring that to the table, try to give that to, the, to everybody. And every, like, you know, Jen was talking about everyone has different interests. Everyone mm completely different backgrounds which is a really good thing because you want different skill sets and different opinions and different you know like just a variety of stuff going on because that actually enhances your project and the team and the work that people are doing so um bringing that together in a in, a, in harmony is actually one of the things that i try to strive for as a leader um and just to get give everyone a voice um and so that everyone feels heard and that you know that you have their expert expert opinion um, yeah. because you can't be an expert in everything um, especially as like a supervisor you you, you kind of you tend to lean on certain people for certain things and that's why they're there so you want to yeah. hear their voice you want to hear what they have to say and then make sure that you make the right decision based on on that mm -hmm. yeah totally and I think that helps with you know your level of trust with the people that you work with like you know at the end of the day I think all of us you know and Zoe included here too like um because I used to work with Zoe by the way <laughs> um but uh I feel like everyone who's worked in this industry ends up spending time with their other coworkers more than their friends, their family in their lives. Like you're at the office for at least eight hours a day. And when it's crunch time, probably a little bit more, if not a lot more. So, you know, you really, you don't have to be best friends with these people, but you have to learn how to get to know them and develop these working relationships with them um, because it'll just make the project that much easier. You have enough stress just by getting those, you know, big things done, all those challenges, the technical challenges, the creative challenges, the clients, all of those things are still going to be there. So anything you can do to reduce any conflicts internally is going yeah. to definitely help the project. Um, and then last question here, we talked about this a little bit before we started the webinar, um, but were there any initiatives um, or things that you had to implement to improve teamwork or or anything that was kind of unique to Love and Monsters? Yeah, I think uh, if you don't mind, I'll take this one because there was something yeah. that came to my head right away. Um, so essentially we we have um, another facility, or sorry, we as in uh, Mill Film or Mr. X has another facility uh, in India, um, in the town Bangalore. And so we would give them some of the work, a little bit of a split. Uh, and so there was, this was the first time that we were working with them um, because the studio was still new to Adelaide. So we were communicating with them and there was, we were starting off with like all these monsters, you know, the assets and stuff, you know, texturing, modeling, rigging, all the good stuff. Um, and there was just, we weren't quite getting what we, we uh, wanted and we were trying to figure out why. Um, and I think like, it's really good to kind of, kind of invest in communicating and, and the relationships because if you don't know the people and it's hard, I mean, now we're used to it because of Zoom, but it's hard to like, you know, virtually kind of uh, connect with people and get to get to know them and, and, and understand what, where the problem really lies. And like, usually it's just a mismute communication. So I ended up having to go to India for a couple of weeks um, and I met the team and I met the whole, you know, I went through the facility and I got to know the production. I got to know like all the kind of problems that they were facing, which I didn't really realize until you actually physically go there and you get to see mm. how they're working. And so I think like that was very unique for a project. Usually you're not often traveling like to another facility to kind of hash out issues. Um, but I found that it was extremely helpful, like just little tiny technical things like I didn't realize they were facing um, until you like literally open their scene with them. Um, and talk with them I think that really really helped and then also like just getting to know them go out for like uh, like a, a lunch or a beer with them and get to know them as people really really helped um, yeah. and you know be able to like kind of tell them about the story and then stuff like I did on set or like be able to motivate them through like you know just you know like a like an emotional attachment to the, to the film or something I think that's nice to connect with them on that level and get a little bit of motivation there so that was definitely unique just to kind of travel uh, for that and be able to hash out um, those issues through like personally visiting them and talking to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's so important. Yeah. No, go ahead, Jen. I was going to say another sort of in, important thing about creating like the team environments, obviously at the end of the day, we're all making this film 
um, for a production company and so a client. Um, so I think the other important thing is as well is, is the team working on the show is keeping them informed about why the client has made decisions um, and why we're, why we're changing these assets and they'll be red instead of um, green, just sort of informing them about the information of, of the reasons why behind it. And I think that really helps as well, like the team feel part of the, the entire film um, and sort of connected to the client as well. And you're not kind of just like isolated, like here's your note, just make it green. Um, and, and you said you get kind of context for that note instead, which I think really helps with the communication and sort of people becoming really part as, of a team. So. Yeah, yeah, make, like making them realize it's it's not always like, it's not about personal opinions, you know, sometimes there's like a bigger picture that you need to take into account. And, you know, even if something was great, sometimes it needs to be changed anyway for, um, you know, whatever reason a it might absolutely. be. Absolutely, <laughs> like we might make something look absolutely amazing and like we're totally happy with it. And then, but the client might be like, oh, I actually, no, I don't really like that so much. I want to do this instead. And then you end up with a product that is, maybe only half as good as what you originally had, but at the end of the day, that's kind of what the client wants. So that's what you have to, you sort of got to put aside and, and sort of accept that as well. Yep, yep. I've been there, I've been there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving along, um, I know we've already kind of been talking about Love and Monsters, um, but um, maybe if you could break down, you know, just a general overview of the film and the extent of your work on it. Like, so you were the sole VFX vendor on the film. So what that means for anyone who isn't familiar with the terminology is that they were the only VFX studio who worked on this film. A lot of other big action movies, they might have two or five or sometimes 10 or more different VFX studios working on the same film. Um, you know, like Marvel movies, for example, they send it out to a bunch of different uh, locations. So tell us about everything that you did for Love and Monsters, which is yeah. ev everything. <laughs> yeah, so basically, yeah, we did the entire film, all the, the VFX shots. The client did have a small in-house um, compositing team um, that sort of just did a little bit of, um, you know, like tracking marker removal. They just did a really small amount. Uh, mm -hmm. But we did, yeah, the, the absolute bulk of the work. And I mean, obviously we have the big hero creatures. So that's kind of like the big obvious work that we did. Um, but on top of that, there was also a lot of effects and environment work. Uh, you can sort of see in the backdrop of this uh, slide there. So we kind of, they shot a plate. Um, obviously it was, you know, it wasn't a post-apocalyptic world. It was just a normal suburb. And we had to turn that into a, a you know, a monster apocalypse. So there was like adding dirt and debris and leaves and, and house destruction to a lot of the plates or a lot of the shots in the film. Um, we probably did over 100 to 200 shots of sort of adding these subtle environment changes to it. And some of that was even just like, some of the shots was just adding tiny little leaves and cracks to the ground um, just to sort of give it that aged feel. Mm. So some of it was super subtle and you don't even realize what we, that we actually did something to that. But all those kind of little bits and pieces are sort of what really helped build the entire world of the film. So that was the main, like, so the basics we did was the big, obviously, creatures, and then we did a lot of environment and um, plate enhancing to sort of sell that post-apocalyptic world. Um, right on. Yeah, and then obviously on top of that, we also had effects work where we had to, I guess, tie them together. So we had the big creatures, but then we had to sort of really re, uh, like build, for example, like the pool frog. We obviously had to rebuild the water to attach that pool frog um, into the environment that it was in. So there was a lot of that sort of um, attachment work as well. Right, right. That's that's pretty cool. So would you would you both say that being the sole vendor was a, a good thing or um, was it more challenging? Because both of you have experience on on bigger titles where you probably were not the sole vendor. So did you think that this was a, a better experience compared to those films or yeah or I mean I say it's actually a, a benefit um because mm -hmm. you have a little bit more creative freedom in what you can do whereas sometimes if you're sharing the work with uh, another vendor um sometimes you're also sharing an asset so you know you might create an asset and they might also have a version of the asset and then the client kind of like oh we like this one better let's change that and then you kind of got to go back and forth and until you come up with the final asset. And then sometimes you end up just working with an asset given to you from another vendor. Whereas I think being the sole vendor, we kind of had the freedom to, to really play around with 
um, our assets and, and creativity. So, yeah, yeah, that, that brings up a good point. Like I've worked on shows where sometimes like schedule wise, it was annoying working with another vendor because we would be waiting for them to deliver us like a creature asset or, or, or something that we then had to composite in or, or use after. So it's like, okay, we don't have a lot of time left, but you're waiting for another VFX studio to finish their portion before they send it to you. And then you have to import it and bring it in. And then, you know, oftentimes it, it doesn't work or something's wrong with it. And then you have to go back and forth a couple of times. Um, so yeah, I, so I guess that this is a pretty cool benefit. Um, and I guess even Stephanie, you, you said you were excited. Like when you got the call and they're like, Hey, this is it. It's the sole vendor. Like, are you, are you, are you in? Yeah. So monsters in it. I mean, it's, it's a challenge, definitely a challenge, but it's like a, to me, like a really good challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and like, like Jen was saying, you get more freedom, I guess. Um, and you get to work with the client uh, a lot more because sometimes the client's dividing their time between all these vendors and there's different things and opinions. So it's really nice to have right. just, like, just a couple of cooks in the kitchen, if you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, yeah. hashing it out together. It's, it can be more fun that way too, you know? Yeah. Um, there, there's one kind of relevant question here that I'm going to answer from Joseph Diaz. Hi, Joseph. Um, he's asking how many VFX supervisors worked on the movie in case there was more than one, how did they work together? Did, did they distribute the shots between different supervisors and house? Um, kind of what happened there? Yeah. Um, so for this one, uh, there was just myself as the VFX supervisor for, uh, no film now Mr. X, the sole vendor. And then there was the client side VFX supervisor. So he his role was more when they were filming it, but he was on set directing what needed to be in the shots to get the, the VFX um, that we need. And then he sort of oversaw the entire work that we did. So I was looking after the team um, entirely on the vendor side, we would then present that work to the, the client side VFX soup. And he would either be like, yay, let's show the director. Or he'd be like, oh, let's maybe tweak and change these sort of things. Um, so he was sort of more dealing with the director. And then I was working more with all the, the artists. Right on. And then um, Stephanie, yeah. maybe just kind of clarify your role as a CG supervisor. Like what makes that different from what Jen was doing? So um, she'll, Jen will kind of uh, lean on me to kind of handle the CG departments. Um, so that means from beginning to end, essentially uh, managing the steps along the way, like it feels like a factory line a little bit sometimes. So you want to make sure that everything is kind of streamlined in a nice way for everybody so that everyone receives um, like a good product and everything goes smoothly, just like, you know, compositing does the same thing or you know, any of the 2D related departments. So um, it's anywhere between like seven to 13 departments that I'll kind of oversee. So um, at the very beginning, you're doing match move and roto anim kind of briefs and like, uh, and, and briefing them on the work and the shot work. And then you end up going into layout and then you have um, animation from there, but then also you've got the build side of it, which is, you know, modeling, texturing, look dev, um, you've got rigging as well. Um, and then that feeds into more of the shot based kind of departments. Um, environments is one which is sort of build in shots, but then they also do map painting and that ends up being shot based. Then you mm -hmm. have uh, or creature effects is what people usually know it as. Uh, effects alone um, and then also lighting. Um, I feel like I always miss a department, but you know, I think those are the major departments that I end up working with. <laughs> You did mention yeah. rigging. People often forget that one. Um, yeah. So we're good there. <laughs> not going to get any angry riggers contacting us. Yeah. Oh, there was, yeah, absolutely. Like there's so many shots that we're doing in so many different departments <laughs> that it's hard for me to answer all the questions about every single department and shots. So it's generally like, yeah, Steph would get um, a brief and then she would sort of make sure like technically and, and that those departments are all sort of working to that goal um, and overseeing that. So, yeah. That's Part of it would be like, you know, making sure they have the, as much as you can, the right software that they need to do their jobs correctly while still achieving like a nice aesthetically pleasing um, or like you know, creative kind of brief. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that Jen has what she needs to be able to send that down the line. Right yeah. on. Um, so let's, let's move along here. Um, I'm talking too much. So let's get into some VFX breakdowns over here. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of different creatures. I mean, a lot of different creatures that we have here and also some of those environments that Jen was talking about at the end. So starting with the boulder snail, oh my God, I love this yeah. guy. This one was my favorite, the boulder snail. <laughs> 
Um, he's just sort of so big and sweet and, and kind of innocent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he was probably the, the least challenging out of all the, the creatures that we had. <laughs> so he was a little bit easier to sort of, um, to, to sort of get through. Uh, but basically in the, the boulder snail sequence here, uh, looking through the, the breakdown, you can see, obviously we started with um, our original plate with the blue screen and just sort of some fake rock or half of a fake rock in the background mm -hmm. there. Uh, so our first steps were to build the, the background environment. We obviously had to rebuild all the trees um, that were featured behind the, the boulder snail. And then yeah. obviously we've got the, the boulder snail himself. So we had to build the, the asset and the model of the boulder snail. And then from that, there was also all the little uh, effects elements that we added on top of him of like some little dirt and slime and bubbles. And he's got this moss and these vines. So I was then adding like, I guess jewelry to the to the boulder snail yeah. and sort of prettying him up with with this kind of really fine detail uh, yeah. and then through the sequence he he sort of moves out of shot and sort of goes up the hill into the distance so right. to then tie him to the environment and the plates that we had we also had to build uh some cg um grass and leaves and dirt on the ground that he kind of interacts with as he's sort of moving through Oh yeah, so that's were, right. Yeah, you can see it there, some of it. Yeah, so he sort of sort of moves along the ground there, and um, he's picking up some leaves and dirt along his way. So they're kind of all the main different departments um, and sort of aspects of building the the boulder snail sequence that we had. And then obviously we've got sorry at the end, all those pieces are given to Comp, and then Comp obviously have to roto out the foreground characters and put all those different pieces together and and grade them to fit within within the environment. So. Yeah, make it make it all look like it's really there. Yeah, yeah. it's it's funny yeah. like, you know, you obviously we know that the snail's not real and this goes for for all of these creatures that we're going to see, but yeah, sometimes like you you don't realize like the tree everything behind I'm pointing at my screen. Everything behind that blue screen had to be recreated. Like, I don't know if you yeah. you can see my my cursor or not everyone, but basically this this whole area behind the snail, all of those trees are fake and had had to be re-added in. Um, so it's not just the, the obvious things. Um, so next we have the giant ant. Um, so this is what we started with. So this is the original plate. Oh, you can see my cursor. Amazing. I'm going to, I'm going to keep using it. Um, so this guy we actually called yeah. the spuzzard. That was his, our name the for him, or the client's name for him. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, you want to take this one, Steph? You want to? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. You from the animation daily here like we actually built an entire creature here but you can't you can't really see a good look at it in the movie unfortunately um but yeah you can see like you know he's got like some grasshopper legs he's got like just a bunch of shoved in parts it was really fun to kind of create the guy um and each like little part was like just mutated a little bit maybe there was a bit of like mold on one part and there was a bit of more shininess and stuff so building him was pretty fun he was just a big mishmash of like a bunch of parts um yeah. and, like, his, his we also had the yeah, Sorry, there was ahead. also like he was. Um, there's a couple of shots in this sequence where they actually um, built the creature on set. So it wasn't a VFX creature; it was like an actual puppet that they had on set. Um, oh. So we also kind of were matching and tying into that. So there's a few shots of the actual puppet that they shot, and then we sort of built um, a CG version of that. Yeah, and there was just cool parts they wanted to augment and like kind of edit on on top of the practical. So we did have really good. I think it's really important to say that when you have a practical item and you're totally replacing it. It's still really, really good to have it because you have all, all this lighting reference, you know, even sometimes material reference, um, especially with these creatures, there's all kinds of different materials, like different ways the light hits uh, slime versus sweat versus like a wet look. And like that's very subtle differences that you could pick up on in the plate. And that was really good reference to have. So even though we were kind of replacing a couple of things, not, all, not a lot, but like a little bit, it was really, really good to have to, that to work with when it was available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then obviously the same again on this one. So we've got the creature, but then we had to sort of tie him into the environment and he needs to interact with it. So we have to then replace the entire shower curtain um, yeah. that he's touching with to give him that the movement and the environment, uh, the movement that it needs to tie him into that um, environment. Like claw it down or whatever. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing it. Because this is like really the kind of first main creature we see right like in the scene I think they like tease yeah. some of them at the beginning when they're explaining like what happened with the the world and everything but I think this is like the main one um yep. sorry, yeah yeah like it's one of the first ones outside. yeah that we see so 
right on really sets the mood um and then crowd favorite at least my favorite giant toad monster um or pool frog we call him the pool, pool frog. frog yeah, yeah. <laughs> we wanted to make him as disgusting as possible so i hope we achieved that <laughs> yeah exactly. this, this one was about just adding a lot a lot of detail to him he's just got so many little bits and um, pieces going on on him um that you can sit there staring at him for ages and, and kind of like picking out all the different sores and um, snot that he's got coming out of his nose and drool. Yeah. And if you the look second on his- eye, like, I didn't notice that until, like, I was looking at these slides. I was like, oh, my God, there's, like, two eyeballs in one eye, like, <laughs> and yeah, these eyeballs. Just- <laughs> and then if you go to the, the right-hand side, he's got this big boil kind of on his um, shoulder there, um, the one above that. And that's actually got these little tadpoles in there swimming around um, in some, like, fluid <sighs> as well. There's just a, a real lot of detail. Gross. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> um, and then you mentioned earlier that like you had to replace the water completely as well. So like, even though you did have a pool shot here, most of the water still had to be replaced to like interact with, yeah, with the so pool frog. With this guy, again, it's the same thing. You've got our creature, but then we have to build the environment around him to, to integrate him um, into the plate that we were given. So for this guy, because he was so big, and interacting with the water, we had to replace the entire pool. Um, and then we also replaced some of the plants around the edge of that pool, um, obviously because the water is sort of spilling up out of that pool and it needed to interact with the, with the ground there. So we mm-hmm. ha- do have to sort of replace a bit of that to um, get that interaction. Right on. Yep. Um, next we have, oh, just, just some more of the toad actually, some more close-ups so everyone can see some of these oh. awesome details. I hope this Grossness. this looks good and it's not too blurry for everyone because it's a, a Zoom thing, but this looks great. This is so cool. And again, like recreate, or I guess, no, you didn't have to recreate the background because you had it here, but there was still some rig removals, like removing this yeah. post and stuff like that. Very cool. I love yeah. this little pool frog. Um, big pool frog, I guess, actually. Um, next we have the giant centipede monster. This one was so cool. It kind of came out of the ground, out from under the ground. Um, so tell us a little bit about this one. What was a, a challenge with this centipede? This one was our, um, he's called the siren. This one, um, he was definitely our most challenging creature. And it was probably on multiple levels of why he was the most challenging. Um, one was because we had an initial concept that the client gave us um, to build. And we kind of built that concept and we sort of started uh, integrating it into shots. And then when the client sort of saw him in, in the shots, they were kind of like, it's not actually quite fulfilling the, the role that he's, he's meant to. And they wanted him to be a little bit bigger and scarier. So we had to go back to the, to the drawing board on him and we had to make some model changes and, and give him some extra arms and make the top half of him a little bit bigger, just to give him a little bit more of that kind of um, scary factor to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was kind of like challenging in regards to that but then also just the way that he is built he's made up of these tiny little um like thousands of little segments and legs and trying to get them all to to animate and work together was a little bit of a challenging um aspect of it because we're locked into the plates that we were given from the client and because he's so big and rigid the way he's made he can only turn so much so to get him to fulfill the the action that he needed to do in these shots. We're finding that we were getting a lot of um, intersection happening on his plates to get him to bend enough to fit within the shot. Um, I mean, mm. Steph, you can maybe talk a little bit more about sort of like solving that technical challenge. Um, for example, um, and then also like, we wanted to add a couple of features to make it easier for the animators. For example, the legs, they kind of do this like wave thing so that when you move one leg up, the next one follows and follows. So you do this like kind of thing. So you don't have to, you can animate each one individually if you want, but also to do it automatically if you like to. So things ah. like that help save time. Um, and then, you know, having like nice limitations for the curling of the, you know, like the, the, the spiraling um, antennas and stuff, like just so it kind of has a pleasing look. Uh, little things like when it bends a certain way, there's a limitation that we would kind of put on like mathematically, like at a certain angle, you kind of stop. You're not allowed to keep going. Otherwise you're gonna have penetrations on the inside of his uh, belly. And then that would create more work for a different department, the tech end of department where they would have to fix those intersections. So we tried to limit those things uh, in the in the rig itself um, just to save on work and also make it easier for the animators. 
Um, but yeah, he ended up being very complicated. And then you can, I don't know if you have a shot of it, but if, if you guys remember, but there's like a scene where the tentacles come out and all of that gets added and making him really scary. And I don't think, I, oh no, this one, is, yeah. Similar to that. that. Yeah. yeah. And there's all this stuff coming out of his mouth. and yeah. So we had to have a separate, I think, asset for that one because just hiding all that stuff in the mouth was just like too much work. So we had to kind of like have a separate thing to make all this stuff come out. Uh, and actually have like tons of stuff come out and, and uh, make it work really well. Um, but also like just from a, from like um, a reference point of view too, making him look real, like was kind of a challenge as well with him making sure the material, because he's kind of like going between like a leather look and like a kind of like hard shelled, you know, beetle almost in a way. So making sure that came across as effective while in the lighting condition that we were facing, which was kind of overcast, you can't really pick up on that sheen really, really nicely. So it was really challenging to kind of balance it out and make him kind of sit in the environment um, in a nice way. Yeah, yeah. And then, and like all the other shots as well, we then had to integrate him into the environment. So for the, the siren, the giant centipede, the, the main thing for him was um, simming uh, dirt and effects, sorry, dirt and leaves. So that was the main thing of what we had to create to sort of tie him into the environment. So yeah, like and you all can of this stuff, yeah. Standing coming out was no mound for it to kind of hide into so we had to come up with like a kind of a solution like where is he going to be in the ground <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah right. so like that whole sort of ground around him we had to replace with with a cg one so that's a good example of stuff you you face like on set you can't really do anything about it and you have to you know kind of come up with a solution in post-production so yeah right on um let's move on to next creature sand gobbler so we have one question here that's kind of relevant and I know it's it's um one of those questions that doesn't really have a concrete answer to but Carlos Santiago is asking how much time do you spend doing only one scene so I think probably every creature probably had their own unique amount of time that was spent on it but was there an average or could you maybe talk about how long it took to make the sand gobbler for example this scene here I mean here. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, all the scenes were kind of being worked on um, and built up at the same time throughout the whole duration of the film. Um, this film, yeah, we were all on it for almost one year um, from beginning to end. And I guess until you see that finished product in, in comp, it is almost a year of, of building these things. So starting from obviously, yeah, modeling and then you've got all the steps along the way. It just takes a lot of time to sort of build each of those steps and, and to pass it on to the next department. I was gonna say an important step too is like the concept art. Actually, we had a lot of really good concept art from this guy, Andrew Baker, um, and he uh, kind of hashed out the designs. Like you, sometimes that's not always the case where, you know, you have to design something for client um, and that takes quite a bit of time as well. And sometimes you go back and forth and that can take up a lot of resources, but at least we had a little bit of a, a start to this. So that was really helpful, I think, but that I'm sure took them months and months to work out alone outside of our thing. I love the sand gobbler. Like he was, That's I remember really going cool. to the seafood market and then there was a, a eel and I was like, that is what I need for reference. Cause this is, I mean, reference is the most important thing I think you can, you can have in visual effects. So I bought an eel and I brought it into the studio and I was looking at it like Ben. Smoke deal. It wasn't alive or anything. It was just. <laughs> it was just like like in the seafood section, but yeah. Um, but it was important to study like the skin and like because it was kind of um, self moisturizing as opposed to wet, and it wasn't. We didn't really want like a worm look, which like with slime and stuff. We wanted something that was just still a little bit moist, but like still had dirt on it. And so looking at the skin itself and looking at like the physical properties was really important, like the chemical makeup of like the skin itself, but also bending it and seeing how the muscles underneath react to um, the skin over top and how, what kind of shapes you could kind of create with that. So when it bends, you've got wrinkles on the inside and that doesn't always happen with every single like, you know, you look at an elephant trunk, for example, that looks a little bit different when it bends as opposed to the eel, which has like kind of elongated muscles along the way um, and we didn't want it to look like quite like a worm on those on the tentacles because worm muscles are actually crisscrossed so they kind mm. of do it when they bend so that was a really good uh, kind of reference point for that so he was fun and then we got to explode yeah. it the best part. <laughs> yeah I don't I don't have a before and after of the explosion but yeah this this is like right as that's happening I think I'm pretty sure um, right before time, like making the organs and stuff and seeing what we we're trying to you know explode exactly yeah, yeah. exactly all the creatures yeah all the creatures are based off um obviously real life 
um, versions of them. And they're all, these are all kind of taken, like obviously the sky jellies here are taken from jellyfish that are normally found um, in the ocean. So yeah, as Steph was saying, we always make sure we found real life, real life reference as our starting point for all these creatures. And then we kind of creatively built on top of those. Um, yeah, they look so cool. These ones were really um, fun to watch. Like most of the creatures are kind of gross and these ones were like, oh, that's pretty. Yeah. Um, but, I've, yeah. but I imagine running into one like in flying through the air would be terrifying. So um, pretty bit deadly. Um, and then we go into uh, Mavis, Mavis, right? We call, we call her Mavis. Um, so tell us a little bit about this because this one's different. As you can see here, um, so this was the, the original plate and then the face was actually recreated. So tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so Mavis was um, originally all puppeteered on set and they got most of it there. But obviously, if you kind of look at a, a robot on set, they just weren't quite able to get all the emotion that they needed. So we obviously had to replace the face so we could animate the eyes to get a little bit more emotion um, out of the story. And that was the same as the hands. You kind of sort of get a lot of gestures out of your hand movement. So we replaced the hand to just give it a little bit more um, emotion to sort of, uh, I guess, uh, bring Joel's emotions and, and sort of Mavis's emotions to this scene. So it, it was a fairly straightforward. It wasn't anything too complex that we did on this because they did a really great job with the, the puppeteer on set. Um, but it was more of just like, I guess, more subtle enhancements to the, to the storyline, so. Right on. Um, sure. And then next we have the hell crab. This one yeah, was this, great. Uh, we brought a crab at the, well, I, my team, uh, the team like uh, Brittany Bell was the texture lead and then Julian Romeo, he was the model lead, at least in Adelaide. Uh, and then we had, you know, a couple of people in um, Bangalore helping as well, like AJ and stuff. So basically, um, we go, we went to the market, we got a crab, a blue swimmer crab, and we shot so much photography of it. And it was like incredibly useful because, you know, you can go to the internet or you can go like, you know, create your own textures, but you're never going to be able to replace like the actual really, really high end uh, photography you do yourself because you're looking at very specific kind of things. So that was incredibly helpful with that. Um, and then just him like dealing with it alone like all of the files like the zbrush file for example was <laughs> ridiculously hard to work with because he was so hero and he, he needed so much detail um and luckily he's in different parts like it's not like it's a soft body animal um mm. it was section so we were able to kind of like section out into different files and work with it and like kind of do one claw at a time in a way um just to get that detail in there and be able to still pump out the work um but like i don't know jen if you want to talk about the eyes and the emotions because that was also a thing we we're definitely trying to achieve in that guy. I don't, yeah. have, a, so, so. I don't have a picture of that one though. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, I do remember that scene with the, with yeah. the eye. But basically like the pool frog, the, the crab was another one where it just, there's a, if you look at him closely, there's just a real lot of fine detail added to him um, to like little bits of moss growing on him. He's even got little bits of um, rubbish that he's caught along the way from swimming in the ocean. Um, he's just got like, we added like a little bit of water and, uh, watery eyes to him to help build that emotion with the animation. Um, again, he's got little bits of slime and saliva in his mouth. He's just really one that if you look at him closely, you'll see just a real amount of like real fine detail added to him. Um, yeah, and, I can and all those see sort of, a little bit more here. Yeah. Yeah. All those little bits of, of details are kind of like really what help add that emotion to him and sort of bring his backstory of to why he's there and, and how he got there. Absolutely. Um, and then last but not least, I know you mentioned it a little bit already, but we have um, quite a few of these environment shots and um, how you had to kind of recreate that post-apocalyptic um, feel to some of these, you know, regular areas. I think a really yeah. good with this, like, uh, sorry, Jen, I was just going to oh. say, um, is that there was so many unique one-off shots like that. Usually with environments and matte painting, you kind of are able to do one setup or a couple of setups and you can share that between shots. And so you're saving a little bit of work and just different kind of angles, but this was, there was so many different looks and so many different shots, just doing one thing and adding one little part. I mean, it was really well managed by like um, Pascal St. Pierre was the lead there. She was like just pumping out the work, doing a really good job with her team. Um, but like also getting reference photography to be able to do it, like that, that was really hard to do, I think. Um, just getting specific stuff in there, like the mold and like looking at reference again, like we keep bringing up the reference of real life, but you know, that was very important for this department for sure. Yeah. And for these environment shots, obviously 
the whole purpose of it is that they can't on set, they can't go destroy a whole suburb and, and crush all the roofs in and, and add spiders to it. So our sort of purpose was to, to bring that environment to, to the place that they did shot. So. Yeah, that's really cool. I, th Sorry, I think it was shot. really well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So that's where I'm so running out of time here. So just quickly, we talked a little bit about this before we started the webinar. Um, first of all, congratulations on the Oscar nomination. Um, for those of you watching who may not be aware of this already, there have only been two other VFX Oscar recipients that were women in the past, um, Sarah Bennett in 2016 and Suzanne Benson um, for Aliens in 1986. So um, I hope you win, um, but even <laughs> just being nominated is, is so important and um, just so amazing. Um, and so I, I asked you this question before we got on the webinar um, and, I, and I loved your answers. You know, was there anything you had to do, you know, as a woman that, that maybe your male counterparts didn't have to do, you know, to, to get to the place that you're at now? Um, and your answers were great for this. Um, so, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, there wasn't, there wasn't anything special I had to do. I, I never sort of went into this, like, I'm a female, I want to, because I'm a female, I want to get to here because there isn't very any, any other females there. Um, for me, it was more of like, my journey has just honestly just been doing what I enjoy and um, mm. just following what I'm passionate about and putting everything I can in, in, into my work. And it just naturally progressed from there. And for me, it's just having confidence, I guess, in your, in your skill, in your work and encouraging. Mm. I mean, I've met some amazing uh, female artists along the way. And I, I think for them, it's just, it's just a matter of having a little bit of confidence in your skill and saying like, yeah, you know what? I, I can be a supervisor and there's no harm in just putting your hand up and, and giving it a go. Um, and, you know, you, you're always going to make mistakes along the way, but that is like the best thing to do is to make mistakes because that's kind of where you learn and you sort of improve from. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love that of, answer. It's, in, in, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, I think that's what, that's the goal that we all want is, is to not have to say, oh, you're a woman in VFX or you're a female supervisor or whatever. It's like, no, we're, we're all just working towards a common goal and you shouldn't have to do anything extra on top of what, um, what your job is. Just, just kind of work hard, you know, put your head down and, and have the confidence in your work. So I love exactly. that. Hopefully like we're yeah. finally at this place <laughs> where, where, yeah, I mean, like, you know, we, we are equal and, and you, as long as you do a good job, you can get to any position you want if you, if you work hard at it. So exactly. that's great. Yeah. I love and that. It. <laughs> um, so just before we get into our Q and a, um, Zoe's going to, um, explain our new compositing course. Thanks, Maxine, for leading the discussion. Oh. So I want to save time for the Q&A, but quickly we'll tell you about how you can have Jen directly as your mentor at CG Spectrum. So we have an advanced new compositing course. CG Spectrum is an authorized new training partner. There is an industry demand for highly skilled compositors, and um, you can take with us a nine-month diploma that prepares you for a career as a compositor, and it will teach you rotoscoping, digital painting, keying, scripting, and lighting. All of our classes have a live Q&A session weekly, so you could be meeting with Jen every week, and you can start as early as May if you apply by April 27th. Yeah. Compositing is my favorite, my favorite department, but I'm biased because <laughs> compositing is my background. <laughs> Robin had a question, um, which I think we touched on a little bit, but how much of the assets do you actually model in studio versus um, using libraries, scans, and outsourcing? Steffi, so, maybe you want to take this one, yeah. Uh, I mean, what you can do uh, is obviously go to cdtextures.com or any of these websites and you can get, you know, a bit of a base. You get some alpha, good alpha brushes um, if we're talking like CG modeling and sculpting, uh, as well as like the texture work, you can still get some maps there. <clears throat> but again, that might account for maybe 30 to 40 percent of some of the stuff that's going to help you out. It's still by hand and you're still kind of editing these maps yourself once you get a hold of them. Uh, and then, like I, like we talked about for the crab, like getting that reference photography and like projecting that onto it, I think was actually the most helpful. Um, and then, you know, like you you can't you do end up painting masks and stuff by hand, so it is a lot of like hand sculpting, hand painting, a lot of handwork. Um, but I think like and then you know you, you could say like yeah okay I get like a stamp or like a scan or whatever from uh, the internet, but you're still editing it yourself or modifying it, so it's a lot. It's just a base really, and it just kind of gets you like thirty. 
20% even the way there. You're doing a lot of stuff by hand, very manual. Um, but as long as you have your reference, like we talk about, you know, and you're matching that, then I think like it's successful. Um, as far as like environments, I think it was very rare that we would actually have like scans. Um, I know movie, some movies have taken advantage of that uh, when it's appropriate, but for our, this particular movie, we weren't using it as much. Um, there was like some set uh, on set, they were scanning a couple of things like LIDAR almost just to give us like a bit of a base of for how, the proportions of certain objects and stuff like on the sand and the sand uh, beach kind of scene, uh, there was a bunch of objects and like the, the, the toilet, I guess he, he blows up a little bit like that was scanned or, and stuff like that is usually a good for a base. But again, you still have to cut, bring it in and modify it and stuff. So like 20% of it is scan based stuff just for base. Um, yeah. Were there a lot of practical effects used as well? Um, Tarek wanted to know about practical effects. Yeah, we had a little bit of um, practical effects that we used. There was um, a little bit of what they shot on set. Uh, for example, even uh, the crab that we see here, he, we did use some live action elements of sand being kicked up um, to help with the, the effects and that we created. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely did have a combination of sort of practical uh, effects elements and sort of obviously effects elements that we created. But for this film, it was probably the majority of it was um, effects work that we created with some practical stuff to enhance it. I actually brought some sand back with me in a bottle <laughs> and I gave it to the effects department. I was like, here, it's, it's great. It's good <laughs> Because everyone's stuck inside and can't go to the beach by themselves. <laughs> Too busy working, no, I'm joking. Um, Josh asked, do you have to go through a ton of designs before landing on a choice or is it more just model something to the whim of the client? Um, for this, we were kind of lucky, as Steph mentioned earlier, they did some really nice concept work um, that we were, we were able to sort of match to as our starting base. Um, obviously, once we've done that, there is a still a lot of back and forth um, presenting that and the new ideas that we sort of added to these assets. Um, so it, there was, yeah, a fair bit of back and forth. Um, until we sort of came up with our final sort of looking assets. Um, and even then our, our final looking assets was, you know, it still took a long time. Um, and, and the shots were in production in, in lighting and comp sometimes before we actually even had our sort of our finished final assets. So. There was one question that stood out to me in particular, if you don't mind, because- Yeah, absolutely. Just talk about how you stay organized and get things done on time. Uh, that's why Jason, and I think it's important to talk about that because we often like we talk about the craft and the art and the visual effects and like the actual like artist work but we always we're always kind of forgetting the production side where you have like coordinators pas you know production managers and the producers like they are working tirelessly to make sure everything's getting out on time and then us like creatives are screwing it all up for them so they have to manage that a little bit and then making sure that like you know we are actually delivering certain things and like coordinating all the little tiny details between the departments it's, it's a lot to manage and so we have specifically uh software that helps us and them and then of course the, the amazing team in production that does that for us so um, yeah there's there's two sort of like clear um i guess vfx teams that work together so you've got your, all your artists and your, your creatives and your technical people and then you've got an entire production team that work alongside all those artists and they're the ones keeping us organized and saying, hey, this is this needs to go out next week. You guys have got to wrap up this, the work on this. So yeah, we couldn't do what we do without having a, a production team to keep us organized. Yeah, that was kind of my background before, before I came to CG Spectrum. So a lot of what I did was, hey, how long do you think this is going to take? Or hey, are you still on track to finish this by this date? Or can I see something by the end of the day? Like I was one of the many people that, um, you know, most of my job was like bugging people like you <laughs> to say like, yeah. hey, where are you at with that? How's it going? What's going on? Um, um, where are you? <laughs> we're PAs, you know. But yeah, and that's the thing with being working with in VFX, it's really creative. And when you're being creative, there's no right or wrong answer. You could just keep going on forever and forever and changing your idea and your concept and, and developing it. Um, but as we are making sort of films to, to deadlines, we do need that production team to sort of say to us, hey, look, you've only got this amount of time to, to sort of come up with something. So yeah, figure it out. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Going back to our earlier discussion about leadership, um, Josh asked how you go about getting better at communication skills. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I'd say it's 
it's the same as um as being an artist it just takes practice and experience as well um i don't think you just i don't think anyone's just magically uh, fantastic at it and it's kind of a learning curve um sometimes you might make mistakes in in not being communicating enough to people so you kind of learn from that you're like okay no i know i do need to share all this information with everyone so I, yeah again it's just same as being an artist takes practice and i think experience as well a couple of rapid fire questions. Um, how many shots did you have on this film? How many VFX shots? Yeah, uh, I think in the end we did close to 550. Um, that was in combination with the, the small team that they had on set. But I think at Mill Film, I think we did, uh, in the end, I think off the top of my head, it was like somewhere around 460. Um, probably wow. a little bit more than that because there were some shots that we did that got omitted from the film as well so right yeah. yes there's always the ones that end up on the floor <laughs> yeah um we yeah. had a couple of questions about software um louise asked what kind of software did you use for the particles effects what was the main but... software that we were using for effects related uh stuff um and then of course maya for organizing some of the pipeline uh related stuff and just maya was the main tool for most of the departments um and then yes Houdini, and then of course katana for some lighting stuff um zbrush again like i mentioned was one of the more main modeling tools uh mari was for texturing um yeah those are the main ones i believe uh and then, and then of course nuke yeah yeah <laughs> nuke for compositing so yeah what was your biggest problem along the way and and how did you resolve it yeah, I mean, to be honest, we, there was quite a few um, challenges along the way, and every film has its its challenges. Um, and for this film, it was, I guess, trying to the creativity, trying to meet with the technical side of how to create that creativity that we needed. Um, Steph, you could probably speak a bit more, maybe about this one if you want. Um, yeah, I mean, there was there's always technical issues. Um, when, a, when a studio starts up, usually there's a few things that need to be, it would take almost a year probably just to get up and running properly. And so we had, we were just starting that studio together. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that we still needed to hash out. And so as we were delivering, maybe we we're also facing a lot of technical issues. Um, so that was quite a challenge. And like, not only is it challenging in a technical level just to do workarounds just to deliver but also i think the motivation of a team can kind of get it, uh, affected if things aren't working correctly for long enough so i think battling that was also a challenge and so just trying to find creative ways to you know keep people going and motivated and like and and just say you know we're solving your issues we feel you're heard um this is our plan keeping them like in the loop trying to make sure that you know there's there's still trust there um and and making sure that you know we still have reasonable workarounds if we can't get everything solved because that's not it's not always the case where you have the resources to fix everything and so you have to find solutions within the time that you're given um so that that was definitely a challenge i definitely learned a lot in that um and but that's how you grow right like you get challenges and then you kind of learn new ways to do stuff and i think that can be exciting to some people too if you're motivated by that yeah um, so then there's always this common line of oh we'll fix it in in comp <laughs> at the end <laughs> never say that what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> not you but like in general there's a like this oh we'll fix it in comp and it's more of like a sometimes if you run out of time sort of to come up with the the cd the cg solutions um 3d solutions because they obviously take a lot more time and technical yeah. behind them that then you end up just resorting to maybe like a 2d approach where you're kind of like you're painting on top of what you have got that's a last resort though <laughs> Well, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to have you. Congratulations again on your nomination, your Oscar nomination. It's so exciting. We'll be watching to see how, uh, how it comes up. But obviously, the film in itself is such an achievement. Um, so thank you for that. Thanks for joining us today. Maxine, no thank you for um, running our discussion. It's just our website. And um, you can always reach us at hello at cgspectrum.com by email. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Steph. Thank Thanks you, for all listening in. <laughs> that was so much fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everyone. everyone. See ya. See ya.